Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Do you get some enjoyment out of this podcast? Do you get some little bit of joy, entertainment, information? Well, if so, you can help keep this podcast going by supporting it through PayPal at WOWB17. That's World of Warbirds B17. You should know that it takes over eight hours to produce each episode from the research to the writing to the recording to the editing. And remember, I'm just one guy with a full-time teaching job and a family. So when I get support from my listeners, it really gives me a boost to get started on the next episode. And that's good for you guys who like to enjoy to listen to them. So thanks. Today's episode is due to a request from Danko, who didn't give his location, but seemed to have a British accent. So I'm guessing he's in the UK. I hope you enjoy it. Today's episode might be a little less detailed than I'd like. Firstly, I don't read Russian, and so I can't access those original sources. Also, the Soviet Union of the 1940s was not the most open of societies, and so the information is more sparse, and I just haven't been able to dig up some of the juicy tidbits that I, and I'm sure you, enjoy. But this is a critically important aircraft to cover. The fact that Stalin personally got involved with design and production details highlights how critical this aircraft was to the Red Army and the ultimate Allied victory. Also, the numbers of this aircraft built during this short time point to its importance. It was the most produced aircraft in history and held that title for 55 long years, until the year 2000 when the humble Cessna 172 would surpass it with 44,000 built. We in the West sometimes forget, or maybe we don't forget, but we just don't appreciate the size and scope of the conflict on the Eastern Front. Mainly because we've seen all the movies and shows and series that have been made for a Western consumption, and sometimes they neglect to mention the Eastern Front at all. Well, let's take a look today by examining one element of it, the IL-2. Design and Development and Prototypes. Firstly, let me give the obligatory, sorry if I mess up the Russian pronunciation. I do my best, and I like to include the Russian words in order to, you know, get the the flavor, but uh, I'm bound to get some wrong, and for that, I apologize. Sergei Vladimirovich. Ilushin was born on the 30th of March, 1894, in very humble circumstances. He was the youngest of 11 children to a peasant family, mainly educated himself and left home early. He did a variety of manual labor type jobs, including helping to keep the grounds at the Kolomayeshki racetrack. In 1910, this was the site of the first All-Russia Festival of Ballooning, and Ilushin was right in there, helping to set up the ballooning equipment and chatting up Russia's pioneer aviators. As has been said on this podcast many times before, he was bitten by the aviation bug. But he wasn't able to do much about it right away. When World War I broke out, Ilushin was drafted into the Imperial Russian Army and served in the infantry, but was later moved into administration as a clerk, as he could read and write. Following that, he saw a request for seven volunteers to join in the new aviation section, and Aleutian had his chance. He at first worked as a mechanic and on the ground crew, but in 1917 he was qualified as a pilot, so he had seen the aviation world from the ground up. In 1918, with the end of the war, Aleutian left the army and joined the Bolshevik party. When the Russian Civil War broke out, Aleutian was again drafted, this time into the Red Army, where he worked as an aviation technician. One of his first assignments was to dismantle and reverse engineer an enemy Avro 504 biplane that had made a forced landing near Petrozavsk. The result was the Soviet U-1 trainer aircraft, and 737 of these were built. In 1921, he left the service again and earned a degree in engineering. 
He entered and rose in the ranks of the Institute of Engineers of the Red Air Fleet, working with such giants of Russian aviation as Polikarpov and Tupolev. He eventually became the Assistant Chief of the Air Force Research and Test Institute. Looking to fulfill a desire for a ground attack aircraft, it seemed obvious that incorporating armored protection would play a major role in the design, as operating low to the ground would mean having to survive a fusillade of ground fire. Although there had previously been Soviet armored ground attack aircraft, namely the Grigorovich designed TSH-1 and 2, these were biplanes and were thus too slow and underpowered with the engines of the time. However, with the newer, higher-powered engines of the late 30s and early 40s, it was deemed time to take a second look, and this is where Aleutian and his team began. Rather than start with an airframe and then bolt some armor onto it, Aleutian had the armor shell be an integral part of the airframe, saving duplication of components and saving weight. They needed to save weight, as the armor itself was going to weigh at least 1,500 pounds, or 700 kilograms. The protection was made up of riveted armored steel plates, securing the aircraft's engine, cockpit, water and oil radiators, and fuel tanks. The first prototype flew on the 2nd of October 1939 and was found to be underpowered due to an unsuitable engine. The McEulin AM-35 could produce 1,371 horsepower, but tended to generate the greatest power output at higher altitude, where the new aircraft was not planned to be operated. They swapped in another engine, the McEulin AM-38, which had been modified from the AM-35 specifically for low-altitude operations. It featured a reduced compression ratio and had a strengthened crankshaft and a newly designed cooling system and revised oil system. It had a single-speed geared centrifugal supercharger set for the best low-altitude performance, and it could crank out 1,700 horsepower. There was some flip-flopping about whether to have a rear gunner or not. Initially, Illusion wanted a rear gunner in the aircraft, but the limited power of the early AM-35 engine meant that the aircraft was too heavy and something had to go. The rear gunner and his gun were seen as a luxury that could be dispensed with. Even with the introduction of the more powerful AM-35 engine, the early IL-2s were built as single-seaters with no protection from the rear. In this configuration, the aircraft passed its state acceptance trials in March of 1931 and was given the designation of IL-2 the following month. It was time to start building the IL-2 in earnest. Production Four factories were tasked with building IL-2s, but only the State Factory No. 18 at Voronezh and Factory 381 at Leningrad had actually started when the German invasion began on the 22nd of June 1941. It was almost too late, with only 249 aircraft having been completed. And then, production was put on hold when the factories had to be dismantled and moved out of the way of the invasion. Although a two-month delay seemed long when you desperately need new aircraft to fight the enemy, it's a remarkably short time if you truly think about the massive effort of logistics required to pick up and move an entire production line of an aircraft during wartime conditions. But two months was too long for Premier Stalin. He famously sent a telegram to the production team. Open quotes. You have let down our country and our Red Army. You have the nerve to not manufacture IL-2s until now. Our Red Army now needs IL-2 aircraft like the air it breathes, like the bread it eats. Schenkman produces one IL-2 a day, and Tretnyakov builds one or two MiG-3s daily. It is a mockery of our country and of the Red Army. I ask you not to try the government's patience and demand 
that you manufacture more ILs. This is my final warning. Close quotes. Coming from Churchill or Roosevelt, the threat in this telegram might be more figurative, or at least lead to a sacking. Coming from Stalin, a final warning can be seen as an actual final warning. The factories took the threat seriously and started cranking out IL-2s and did not stop until they had built an amazing 36,183. There were several variants. The IL-2 Type 3M was a two-seat IL, armed with a Noodleman Suranov NS-37 in gun pods under the wings instead of the usual 20mm cannon. The type was first used in combat during the Battle of Kursk, but the combat effectiveness was judged to be quite low and production numbers were limited, in quotes, to about 3,500. There was a training version known as the IL-2U. The IL-2T was a torpedo bomber built for the Soviet Navy with cannons removed to save the weight and modified to carry a single torpedo. Although regular IL-2 M3s could also be fitted with torpedo racks as a field modification. Finally, there was an experimental IL-2I armored fighter prototype. This proved unworkable due to its low speed, which would allow it to be able to only intercept older Luftwaffe bombers. Operational History For an aircraft that would eventually be famous the world over, and would in some ways stand in for the entire Soviet aerial war effort, the IL-2 had a very inauspicious start. It was a very new aircraft, and so pilots were either very poorly trained on it, or not trained at all. Many had basically learned only to take off and land. Few had fired any armament before going into combat, and no tactics or operational doctrine had yet been worked out. If that wasn't bad enough, if a pilot and his IL-2 had managed to fly, fight, and get back to his home base, the ground crews had also not received any instruction in servicing, fixing, or rearming them. As previously stated, there had been 249 IL-2s available on the first day of Barbarossa. By the third day, 10 had been shot down, 19 were lost for other operational reasons, and 20 IL-2 pilots were dead. A month later, only 20% of the IL-2s were still operational. But things would change. Production would increase dramatically. I'm sure partly due to Stalin's personal involvement. Also, rear protection would be reintroduced, again partly due to Stalin. Supposedly, an IL-2 pilot had written to the Soviet leader reporting that, quotes, the aircraft is absolutely unprotected against enemy fighters attacking from behind. In most cases, the fighter approaches from behind, trying to knock out the engine or kill the pilot. Close quotes. It was a pretty ballsy or desperate move for the pilot, considering how Soviet military culture, to me, didn't seem all that conducive to complaining. However, whether it was the result of the letter or not, a two-seat version soon went into production and the single-seaters were field-modified by cutting a hole in the rear fuselage and installing a impromptu rear gunner position. Adding the rear gunner caused handling problems due to the increased weight and the shift in center of gravity. So-called arrow wings were designed to deal with this problem. These had leading edges that swept back 15 degrees on the outer panels with nearly straight trailing edges. This shifted the C of G back to where it needed to be and swapped metal outer wing panels for wood, which decreased the weight and allowed for an increased fuel capacity. Later models were upgunned from their 20mm to 23 or 37mm cannon. The addition of the rear gunner with his 12.7mm UBT machine gun definitely helped the aircraft's survivability. 
However, the rear gunner was always going to be an afterthought. He didn't even have a proper seat. He sat on a canvas sling. He also didn't benefit from the armored bathtub that the pilot was in. And the six millimeters of armor protection that the gunner had could really only stop small arms rounds. The rear gunner had a much greater chance of getting killed than his crewmate up in the front who had the big engine and metal plate all around and armored glass in the windshield. Along with better protection, new tactics and weapons were being adopted. Initially, straight-in, low horizontal attacks were made at 160-foot altitude. But this was changed to attacks where the target was kept to the pilot's left and a shallow turning dive of 30 degrees was used, using echelons of 4 to 12 aircraft at a time. The circle of death tactic was also developed where up to eight Sturmoviks would fly in a defensive circle, each plane protecting the one ahead of it with its forward machine guns. Individual IL-2s would take turns leaving the protective circle, attacking the target, and then rejoining the circle. As for weapons, eight unguided RS-82 or four RS-132 rockets could be carried. Although these rockets, which were similar to those that would be used in the famous Katusha rocket launchers, could definitely destroy vehicles with direct hits, they were not known to be very accurate. So if a sniper weapon wouldn't do the trick, what about a shotgun approach? That was the PTAB aircraft bomblet. These little bombs that only weighed 2.5 kilograms, that's 5.5 pounds, had high explosive anti-tank shaped charges that would easily punch through the relatively thin armor of all heavy German tanks. Roof armor, that is. Almost 200 of these little bombs were loaded into canisters and dropped on tank and vehicle formations from 330 feet and below. One IL-2 could create what they called a fire carpet 70 meters long and 15 meters wide. That's 230 feet long and 49 feet wide. Within which, basically, any vehicle would be destroyed. As for actually how effective IL-2 attacks were, reading over various reports can be confusing. But I've seen the same thing with many other fighter bombers such as the Stuka, the Typhoon, or P-47. The pilots often wildly over-report kills, sometimes claiming more vehicles destroyed than were actually there. Troops on the ground would either claim that the air support was their angels or their devils, depending on whether the air support was for them or against them. However, when sober accounting types went in and counted and tallied up the actual damage, the number of kills was actually much, much lower. It seems likely that the psychological effect of these aircraft far outweighed their actual destructive power. But then again, psychological effect is a real effect. If it makes the attacking side attack harder because they think the objective has been suitably softened up by fighter-bomber attack, then it's kind of worked. It equally works if the enemy runs because they see the supposedly deadly IL-2s rolling in for an attack. I think we just have to accept that there were no super weapons and that fighter bombers were just one other instrument in the orchestra to victory. But the IL-2 certainly earned a reputation from both sides and this can be seen by the number of nicknames that it had. Firstly, it never had an official name other than IL-2. Sturmovik is a generic Russian word meaning ground attack aircraft. We know the pilots loved it because they called it by the diminutive Ilusha, which denotes affection. Soviet troops called it the hunchback, the flying tank, or the flying infantryman. Wehrmacht troops also called it the flying tank, as well as the black death. I think I like the Luftwaffe pilot nickname for it the best. They called it the Zement Bomber, 
the concrete bomber due to its ability to survive punishment. Although the Stormovik was designed as a ground attack aircraft, it could and was used as an air-to-air -air attacker against aircraft such as the Henschel HS-126, Junkers Ju-87, Ju-52, Henkel HE-111, and Fuck a Wolf FW-200 Condor bombers. Although the IL-2 had impressive armor and improved tactics, it was still operated in a very, very dangerous environment. And if jumped by enemy aircraft, the usual defensive tactic was to dive, fly low, and close the throttle as the fighter closed in. Hopefully, the fighter would overshoot and fly into the IL-2's firing zone. But losses were the highest of all types of Soviet aircraft. The worst year being 3,115 destroyed in 1943. So it's just as well that they built so many of them. IL-2s served not only with the Soviet Air Force, but also in Bulgaria, Hungary, Mongolia, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Yugoslavia. They were in active service until 1954. Pilots Yuri Kirkikov was born in 1924 in Moscow and flew, fought in, and survived what the Russians called the Great Patriotic War. We are lucky that he was interviewed and his story was recorded both in Russian and then translated into English on the iremember.ru website. I have adapted his story from the interview format to be more of a narrative. So now let's listen to the words of a man who was there. I, Kirkikov Yuri Mikhailovich, am a native Muscovite in the fourth or even fifth generation. I was born in a military family. My father and uncle were military specialists. They had fought starting from 1914 and after the revolution worked in the main engineering dictoriate of the general staff starting in 1921. Father had the rank of a colonel and uncle a lieutenant general. I was born in 1924 and lived and went to school at Christi Purdy, opposite the Colosseum. Now it is the Sovremenic Theater. From 1930 to 1941, I went to school number 311 on Lobvosky Lane. In 1940, I joined an aviation club. They had turned me away from everywhere, said I was too young. But I finally got what I wanted, and they let me in on the condition that I would bring a note from my parents saying that they were not opposed. For the first time, I took off into the air in September 1940 at the Kraskovo airfield near Moscow. On the 1st of May 1941, I, as the Aviation Club student, participated in the last peacetime parade on the Red Square. In July 1941, I graduated from the club. They gave me a certificate of completion. It would help me out a lot later. All aviation clubs sent their students on to aviation academies. We were supposed to go to Tbilisi, but... Because the war started, all 1941 graduates were sent to Saratov, where we started flying SBs. They called it a candle. It was completely unprotected and, besides that, made of duraluminum. Any bullet or shell fragment caused a fire. I started flying it and then an order came from the Defense Ministry, which said, transfer the Saratov Academy to the Airborne Forces. We immediately started flying gliders. We would be towed by U-2, R-5, SB, Douglas, and others. This way we gained experience. The plane would make a circle, and at a height of 500 to 600 meters, we would detach. We circled, and we were supposed to land near a landing sign. You couldn't afford to make a mistake in these gliders. For example, after making the last turn, if you miscalculated, you would fall before the landing signs. There was nothing to pull you up. No engine, so you would fall. That's why we made our approach aiming to overshoot, and in order to descend, we banked and dived, which allowed us to lose altitude and then land with a minor deviation. 
Besides that, I went through training as a group commander. Explosives, hand-to-hand combat, fighting dogs. Yes, yes, we put on dogs, coats, and fought dogs. Like everyone, in October 1941, I submitted a request to be transferred to fighter aviation. It worked. On December 31, I was transferred to a fighter aviation academy. There, we immediately began flying UT-1s, UT-2s, IL-16. Our Belyi Kluich airfield was located 18 kilometers from Lulyanysk, not far from the Volga. It was an excellent airfield with good approaches. In October, I and my comrade, Boryo Bezku Bezrukov, with whom we had gone to school and the aviation club, and later found ourselves at the Saratov Academy, had to deliver some things to Moscow. They were bales, boxes. We came, signed, turned over the cargo, and then Borea and I decided, as patriots, to go to the front. We infiltrated to the forward positions. We found some rifles and fired them. There were 45 millimeter guns deployed next to us, operated by real soldiers. These were already experienced people. They found us out, that we were strangers. They asked, who are you? Where are you from? What order do you have? We told them everything that happened. That's where the certificates from the aviation club and our papers about our trip to Moscow helped us out. Get out and don't come back, they said. We picked up and ran. We got lucky with transport. We came back to Saratov and no one found out about it. All of that took no more than a week. At least it went unnoticed. But I did get the for the Defense of Moscow medal. Then an order came to retrain for IL-2. They picked out only the most gifted students, so they would teach us as little as possible. There was no fuel. So they sent us to a reserve airfield at Dietkov, which was 18 kilometers north of Dimitrov. That's where pilots learned combat skills, bombing, shooting. All of that took literally several hours. Possibilities were limited. And then a buyer would come from the front. And then we would go with him. Jora Parshkin came for us. He was an ace, a ground attack pilot. He shot down 10 aircraft in an IL. He fought from the very first day of the war and to the end. Excellent man. I met him often later in Leningrad on the Litenyi Avenue. It was 1944 and he took us. We found ourselves in the 566th Ground Attack Aviation Regiment. I was put into the first squadron of the 566th Regiment. Mikhailik was the squadron commander. He was future twice the hero of the Soviet Union. We were lucky. It was a period between operations. There was an opportunity to train, to fly in formation, to go into the zone and we started working at full steam in the Baltics. The regiment fought mainly in the Central and Leningrad fronts. The IL-2 was an excellent aircraft for those times. Carried 600 kilograms of bombs, 8 rockets, 323 millimeter shells for the cannon, 150 per gun, and 1,800 rounds for each machine gun. 3,600 rounds. 10 DAG-10 distance aviation grenades for the protection of the lower rear hemisphere. If a German appeared, you would press a switch and a grenade would fall on a parachute and explode 150 meters away. Besides that, we carried an infantry submachine gun and some hand grenades. The engine was the most vulnerable part of the aircraft. The wings were fine, more or less. If a fuel tank was hit, that wasn't bad either. Why? When approaching the target, we opened carbon dioxide canisters which filled the empty space of fuel tanks. If a bullet pierced the body and hit a fuel tank, the sealer would fill the hole, fuel would not leak out, there was no vapor and consequently no combustion. The gunner had a 12.7 millimeter Berezin machine gun. The rear gunner was a real necessity. His usefulness was beyond question. Some people said that there were seven gunners killed for each killed pilot. This wasn't true in my regiment. 
We had 105 pilots and 50 gunners killed. Why? Because the regiment fought from the beginning to the end of the war. The first half of the war, it was a one-seat aircraft, and the second half in two-seaters. And most of the time, they died together. A ground attack pilot, according to the statistics, managed to fly seven to eight sorties and then died. Such were the statistics. We started in the Baltics, went through Prussia, and finished in Wittenberg, from where we flew sorties to Königsberg and even Danzig. Everyone was at first a wingman at the front. Vazia Mikliev and I flew about 40 sorties. He went to Moscow to get his star, the gold star of the hero of the Soviet Union, and came back only in the end of April. I was already a leader. Usually our missions were the bombing of former positions. Once I went to reconnoiter on foot, and I talked to the infantry there. The infantry commander said, You guys don't have to shoot. Fly here and show yourselves. That would be enough. And if you bomb, you'll always be welcome guests. We sank ships in ports. We Four times we flew against airfields. That was scary business. They were well protected. We worked on armored concentrations. Well, against those armored targets, we sent hundreds of aircraft. We wanted to wipe everything off the face of the earth. We were always escorted by fighters. Very often during the Prussian operation, we were escorted by the Normandie Neyman unit. At the beginning of the war, fighters really made the lives of ground attack pilots difficult. But by the end of the war, it was the AA artillery that was the scary business. Several dozen small caliber AA guns were deployed and would fire into the same spot. And all around, black clouds from medium caliber AA guns. You would fly and not know which of them would kiss you. Of course, we performed an anti-AA maneuver. We threw our plane side to side. Then we would get into the circle above the target and start working on it. The little ones, meaning the fighters, would cover us. The number of passes you made depended on the situation and the amount of resistance. If there was a lot of AA, Lord help us. Not single guns, but concentrated in quadrants. I would sometimes count up to 40 guns. An uninterrupted stream of bullets. Small caliber AA artillery was especially dangerous. Then it would be only one pass. You would use everything at once. Rockets, guns, bombs. If the resistance was not that great, well then several. Four to six times we would attack. We approached the target in formation, if weather allowed, at the altitude of 1,200 to 1,400 meters. And departed after assembling, also in formation at the same altitude. We always attack from a dive, 30 to 40 degrees. You wouldn't have time to fire everything at a steeper angle, 30 to 40 degrees. That is the angle that provided the complete use of all weapons. We had anti-tank bombs. We took about 280 of them. There were also 25 kilogram, 50 kilogram, 100 kilogram bombs. Four bomb hatches, 600 kilogram load. We would bomb them from the altitude not lower than 1,400 to 1,500 meters. If there were low clouds, 400 to 600 meters, but then we put in delayed fuses. Sometimes you would make the first pass, and then the second one, then they would say from the ground, wait a little. When the infantry passes, we'll redirect you to other targets. So we would work this way, stay in the air, then we would work other targets based on the commands from the observation post. That was the procedure. We flew sometimes three sorties per day, sometimes three, but that was a lot, a lot. If someone says it wasn't scary, they're lying. The moment of expectation was the scariest and the most unpleasant. For example, they would say, at 1400 you will attack such and such airfield. You sit there, 1400 passes, nothing. 1430 passes, nothing. 1500, no order. You sit in the cockpit waiting for the rocket to signal takeoff and nothing. Your legs start shaking. A real panic starts. After all, 
there was no guarantee that you wouldn't be shot down during the mission. When the rocket would shoot up in the air, your head would start working in a different direction. Panic would be turned off. Then there was an unpleasant feeling when we approached the target, but we would not be attacking it immediately. They would be preparing for us and fire. After the attack started, that was it. The pilot was at work, looking for targets, pushing triggers, rockets, guns, machine guns, pulling bomb releases. Bombs could be released by the buttons, or if you wanted to release them all at once, you pulled an emergency lever. Everyone had a gun camera, which was working when you were firing the guns. If you set a vehicle on fire, it would be recorded. If you worked a tank, that would be recorded. Besides that, the gunners would have wide area cameras. There would usually be a couple of them per group. It covered a wide area, and after we landed, the film was printed. Besides that, when approaching the front line, we established communications with the observer, usually a representative of the air division. We could recognize his voice. He would literally aim us. Guys, a little to the right, okay, now. He gave us the permission to attack. He told us where the bombs were falling. On a second pass, he would introduce corrections. His confirmations were taken into account. Sometimes errors were made. A pilot named Lenka killed 118 men at the end of the war. It, it wasn't his fault. They told him before the mission, bomb that target. But he had to get there first, maybe 30 minutes. While they were flying there, the situation changed. We captured that place, but nobody told him. The group worked the target. 118 of our soldiers died. He returned and they tore off his shoulder boards, but immediately investigated and gave them back. Later on, he was the Air Force commander of the Belarusian military district. We got hit a couple of times. A shell hit a wing on the 28th sortie. We made it back miraculously. The hole was about a meter in size. If a bullet hits, the smell of burned metal can be felt. I smelled it. Turned my head, and there it was, a hole. But I was lucky. The shock wave and fragments went to the gunner. His legs were mangled. Communications were disrupted. We landed at Wittenberg, and I taxied off, turned off the engine, jumped out onto the wing. The gunner, Viktor Sakhev, Siberian, born in 1926, was just lying there. Guys ran to us, pulled him out, barely saved his legs. But it turned out that I was also hit. A fragment scratched the back of my head. Where did it manage to penetrate? They wanted to put me in a hospital, but I refused. Technicians worked well. If a plane didn't return, for technical reasons, well, something happened. That was very serious. Such occurrences were always investigated. On the last day of the war, the first sortie was at 10 o'clock in the morning, and the second was around 2 p.m. to the Zemland Peninsula. We worked over its very edge. We returned. They refueled us for the third sortie. So we taxied and waited for the order. Then the chief of staff, Nikolai Ivanovich Borov, ran to us. Yuria, taxi back. It's over. We turned off our engines and fired into the air in joy. The war was over. The war was ended for me in Wittenberg. I had flown 84 sorties. And then I flew ILs and MiGs for a long time. Although Yuri is quoted... In many sources about his experiences during the war, I have not been able to find anything about his post-war life. Except that, perhaps he remained in the Air Force by his statement that he flew ILs and MiGs for a long time. What about Sergei Lushin? After the war, he designed commercial airliners, such as the IL-18 and IL-62, which were very popular with Aeroflot and the airliners of many Eastern Bloc states. He remained the chief designer at Aleutian until illness forced his retirement in 1970. He died in 1977 in Moscow. Because IL-2s were made in such numbers, served in so many different nations, and remained in active service until 1954, there are quite a few examples on display. Surviving ILs can be seen displayed in the Czech Republic, Hungary, Norway, Poland, the UK, and USA. 
Of course, Russia has many, including an airworthy model with the Wings of Victory Foundation in Moscow. The Flying Heritage and Combat Armor Museum in Everett, Washington has an airworthy IL-2, which was reconstructed from parts of four different wrecked aircraft recovered from Russia. It is powered by a reversed Allison V-1710-113. I'd love to see it in flight one day. <laughs>